on World News Tonight. Tonga in trouble. Following the devastating blow from Mother Nature at the island nation, locals struggle to cope as more devastation ensues. Entire islands destroyed under massive waves cause nationals outside the country fear for their loved ones. Tonight, more updates on the chaos. Party gate scandal. Even more backlash ensues following ignorant remarks on the illegal gathering of the leader. Will the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom continue to lose face under public scrutiny or will responsibility of the event be placed on the right shoulders? Find out tonight. Fighting Omicron All hope may be lost in the fight against the Omicron variant as new data reveals promising results of the Pfizer COVID pill. However, the variant continues to wreak havoc across the globe. Letting away. Despite the pandemic bringing bloom to most families, these children take a break from the rest of the world as they enjoy a land of snowy bliss. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with a look at the washed away Tonga. Tonga has weathered most of the storm with islands destroyed completely and communication with the rest of the world being cut short due to the tsunami. Many Tongans abroad fear that they might not have the chance to see their loved ones again. Tonight, the first image is taken in the skies over Tonga, revealing vast devastation after a volcanic eruption triggered a massive tsunami, leaving at least three dead. But the fear is that number will grow higher once rescue crews can reach the ravaged areas. This once bustling port, now buried in ash and dust, a lush green neighborhood, now just a sea of gray. The island that surrounded the underwater volcano before its eruption, now seemingly gone. The images captured from planes sent by New Zealand and Australia providing a glimpse of the desperate need on the ground. The ash that now covers the islands creating a dual crisis, contaminating the water supply leaving thousands with nothing to drink and blanketing the airport's runways, making it impossible for planes carrying humanitarian aid to land. 60% of the runway has been cleared um, and this is done manually. Um, I hear up to 200 volunteers are sweeping the runway in preparation for um, the supplies to land on Thursday or Friday. New Zealand's Navy now sending bottled water and other essentials by boat, but those supplies will take days to reach Tonga. The massive eruption over the weekend reportedly causing a tsunami with waves more than 50 feet high. The Tongan government says it began rescue efforts on Sunday, finding some outer islands completely destroyed by its impact. The tight-knit island community already beginning to grieve together. The full impact of the catastrophic natural disaster still largely unknown. With phone lines and internet access down, Tonga's leader today with a glimmer of hope, saying cell and internet service could be back up soon. Within the next 24 to 48 hours, um, they may be able to restore some level of service. And um, what, what that means for uh, Tongans in Tonga and our diaspora overseas is that we're able, we'll be able to be in touch with our loved ones. But for Tongans around the world, that wait is excruciating as the need for help grows more apparent by the day. As new findings on the investigations of the U.S. Capitol riots come to light, the black clash follows through as well with pro-Trump lawyers such as Rudy Giuliani have been subpoenaed over the attacks and are expected to comply with the investigation committee. Rudy Giuliani and two others were subpoenaed on Tuesday by the U.S. House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol riot. Giuliani had been told to hand over documents and sit for a deposition next month, along with lawyers to former U.S. President Donald Trump, Sidney Powell, and Jenna Ellis. The committee also subpoenaed Boris Epstein, a former Trump advisor. Committee Chairman Representative Benny Thompson said in a statement, quote, the four individuals we've subpoenaed today advanced unsupported theories about election fraud, pushed efforts to overturn the election results, or were in direct contact with the former president about attempts to stop the counting of electoral votes. Giuliani's lawyer called the subpoena political theater, while Powell, Epstein, and Ellis did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Giuliani's New York attorney's license was suspended last summer, after an appeals court determined he spread misinformation about the 2020 presidential election, won by Democrat Joe Biden. Powell and Ellis also took part in attempts to overturn the vote. 
A source familiar with the House investigation said the committee is aiming to release an initial report in the summer and a final one in the fall. America continues to intervene to mitigate the escalating tensions between Ukraine and Russia. The most recent attempt at doing so will be the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's talk with the Russian Foreign Minister. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will try to defuse a crisis with Moscow over Ukraine when he meets with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Geneva on Friday. Blinken's meeting will come on the heels of visits with Ukrainian leaders in Kiev and European officials in Berlin. With tens of thousands of Russian troops amassed in and near Ukraine, and as Russian forces have moved into Belarus for joint military drills, the White House on Tuesday warned Russia could launch an invasion in Ukraine at any point. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Our view is this is an extremely dangerous situation. We're now at a stage where Russia could at any point launch an attack in Ukraine. Uh, and what Secretary Blinken is going to go do uh, is highlight very clearly there is a diplomatic path forward. It is the choice of President Putin and the Russians to make whether they are going to suffer severe economic consequences or not. Blinken spoke with Lavrov on Tuesday and urged de-escalation, according to the State Department. A senior official said the pair decided it would be useful to meet in person. Lavrov told reporters Tuesday that Moscow would welcome U.S. diplomatic efforts. But Lavrov reiterated Russian accusations that Ukraine was sabotaging agreements aimed at ending the conflict between Ukrainian government forces and pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. Russia, which annexed the Crimea Peninsula from Ukraine in 2014, has denied any plans for an attack. But Russia says it could take unspecified military action unless its demands, including a promise by the NATO alliance never to admit Kiev, are met. U.S. talks with Russia ended in a stalemate last week. On Tuesday, Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby said the U.S. continues on its path of diplomacy with Russia, but is on alert should talks fail. Again, we see no signs of, uh, uh, of de-escalation, so um, uh, we're going to continue to try to pursue the diplomatic path um, and, um, and as an administration make sure that we're, uh, that we're ready uh, should that path fail and should there be another incursion uh, of uh, Russian forces into Ukraine. The hypocrisy continues with state officials refusing to abide by the regulations imposed on the general public. This time, it's Boris Johnson. Further developments in the Partygate saga has the British public calling for the Prime Minister's resignation. And all eyes are on what will turn up from the ongoing internal investigation. He did not know that he was breaking rules which he himself set. That's Boris Johnson's rebuttal of claims by his former top aide that he lied about a Downing Street party held during the UK's strict lockdown. He's laid the blame on, well, nobody. Nobody told me, I can absolutely, I'm absolutely categorical about this, nobody said to me this is an event that is against the rules, uh, that is in breach of uh, what we're asking everybody else to do, uh, should not go ahead. When I went out into that garden, I, I thought that I was attending a, a work event. The Prime Minister has emerged from Covid isolation to be met with growing calls for his resignation, including from several of his own MPs, over a string of alleged social gatherings. Boris Johnson set the rules. He didn't need anyone to tell him the party he attended broke them. If he had any respect for the British public, he would do the decent thing and resign. You, Mr. Speaker. An internal investigation is looking into whether Johnson broke the rules and whether he lied about it to Parliament and the public. He dodged questions asking if he'd step down should this prove to be the case. The Conservative Party's ratings have plummeted. There's been public outrage over the gatherings, some of which took place when British people could not visit relatives who were dying from COVID-19. A few days ago, North Korea appears to have tested the same type of tactical guided missiles it launched in 2019 and in 2020, the KN-24. South Korea's military says it has the capabilities to detect and intercept its kind of projectile. A photo released by North Korea's state-run media on Tuesday shows that what the regime fired the day before appears to be its KN-24 missile. The North KCNA reported that the regime conducted a test of its tactical guided missiles and claimed that the two missiles precisely hit an island target in the East Sea. 
Tactical guided missiles are short-range weapons used in the immediate combat area. The KN-24 resembles the U.S. Army's tactical missile system and is typically launched from what's called a TEL, or a Wheel Transporter Erector Launcher. It's known to be able to fly on a complicated trajectory to evade interception. This marks the fourth time that the North has launched this type of missile. It last fired the KN-24 in March 2020 after testing it twice in August 2019. But regarding the latest launch, South Korea said it has the ability to detect and intercept it. Our military has the capability to detect and intercept this weapon, and we're continuing our efforts to strengthen our defense systems. Seoul's military had earlier confirmed on Monday that the North launched two projectiles that appeared to be ballistic missiles from an airfield in its capital city of Pyongyang. It said that the missiles flew about 380 kilometers at a maximum altitude of 42 kilometers. The latest missile was the fourth time this year that the North had tested some type of projectile. The previous two launches involved what the North claimed to have been hypersonic missiles, which are capable of maneuvering at very high speeds. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight and we move on to the COVID updates around the globe. While the numbers of COVID infections are driven to new highs in India, researchers expect a possible plateau of the caseload in multiple parts of the nation. However, some states fear the worst as predicted peaks are yet to be reached according to the newfound data. We have up there in the World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar who joins us now from Delhi in India for more. Gayatri. Yes, Shanali. The latest analysis of COVID-19 situation by scientists reveals that the overall peak of the third wave in India will arrive on January 23rd, but the daily case is unlikely to cross 4 lakh. Delhi and Mumbai have already reached their peak earlier in the second week of January. IIT Professor Manindra Agrawal, one of the researchers of the Sutra Consortium that has been working with COVID numbers since beginning of the pandemic, said tra the trajectories have been changing across the country. The, uh, there are might be two reasons for that. One, the spread of Omicron among those uh, with less immunity has slowed down and uh, the population group is now exhausted. It was revealed that Mumbai reached its peak on January 12th and the numbers are now decreasing rapidly. Delhi peaked on 16th and Kolkata on January 13th. Delhi authorities have been hinting at the plateau as the national capital so its daily cases stabilizing. While pandemic is caused, uh, causing multiple medical and economic difficulties, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that a collective global effort is needed to deal with the problems posed by cryptocurrencies. India has been mulling virtual currency related regulations that were widely expected by, uh, to be introduced in the winter session of the parliament before being shelled. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. We have some good news for you. Pfizer has announced that its antiviral COVID-19 pill is also effective at treating the Omicron variant. Given the surging number of cases of Omicron and the ineffectiveness of the vaccine to prevent its spread, the effectiveness of the antiviral pill comes as a sigh of relief and a win for medical science. The findings were based on three laboratory studies by the drug maker. One of the studies found that the treatment showed similar antiviral activity in Omicron and other variants of COVID-19. Other study found that a key ingredient in the treatment helps prevent the virus from replicating. And the final study found that similar quantities of the drug were needed to be effective against the variant. Paxlovid is known to be 89% effective in reducing hospitalization or deaths among high-risk patients. There are mixed signals in the United States as the rate of infections drop in some parts of the Northeast but explode in the West. Cases amongst children are spiking dramatically as well and almost a million cases reported last week. All of this comes as America can now order those rapid at-home test kits from the government. One day earlier than expected, the federal government's website for free COVID tests has gone live. 
In a soft launch, the White House began taking orders for up to four tests per household. The website officially launches tomorrow after a year of long waits and rapid tests, often nowhere to be found, despite President Biden's promise last year. The bottom line, this winter, you'll be able to test for free in the comfort of your home and have some peace of mind. Still today, many pharmacies and major retailers are out of stock, leaving families like the Pretty Hefferins frustrated. Look, you're negative. Like so many, Cons Pretty says finding rapid tests to get her kids back in school has been nearly impossible. The Biden administration says tests will ship within 7 to 12 days, landing at your door at the end of this month, best case scenario. Epidemiologist Abigail Echohawk is the executive vice president of the Seattle Indian Health Board. When you, they are focused simply on using the internet, we're going to see that those in rural America, those on native reservations, are not going to get the same access to information, and that will continue to drive the inequity of the impact of COVID-19. The White House has promised 500 million free tests via the website and says it'll add a phone number to order soon. We're just really trying to catch up. In Seattle, rapid test manufacturer InBios wants to produce 5 to 10 million tests per week to help meet demand. For parents like Preti, only a negative test can get the kids back in the classroom. As families hope, the White House will deliver. France's education minister faced calls to resign after regretting the symbolism of a holiday escape to Ibiza, where he announced a strict COVID testing protocol for students that sparked a fierce backlash from teachers. As teachers in France gear up for their second walkout in a week, the country's education minister is on the defensive. Jean-Michel Blanquer in hot water after a media part investigation uncovered he unveiled back-to-school COVID protocols while on holiday in Ibiza. I recognize there is symbolism in the place I chose. I should have chosen somewhere else. I regret the symbolism of it, but for two years with the majority, with my teams, with all the teachers across France, we have maintained an open school policy. This is what is essential, and let's not get lost in trivial matters. But while the education minister is eager to turn the page, opposition politicians say it's time he goes. While teachers are all right with the education minister going on vacation, they say being so far away while unveiling a protocol which impacts millions is a problem. It's the straw that broke the camel's back with this back-to-school policy. The minister is checking all the boxes like it's a game of bingo on how to mess up a return to class. It's a symbolism that on the eve of a difficult day, he was far away from our troubles in all senses. Teachers in France have taken aim at the government over what they say has been a chaotic COVID strategy. Their second walkout is planned for Thursday. The telecommunication industry has not turned a blind eye to the concerns raised by the aviation sector. As a result, some of the big names ready to enter into the 5G market have decided to delay the fruition of their work to ensure the safety and sustenance of flights and its passengers. In a move to avert a significant disruption to U.S. flights, telecommunication giants AT&T and Verizon agreed to temporarily defer turning on some wireless towers with 5G service near key airports, a third such delay for the two companies. The new C-band 5G wireless service, which was set to begin on Wednesday, threatened to cause massive flight cancellations. The Federal Aviation Administration had warned that potential 5G wireless interference could affect sensitive airplane instruments such as altimeters and significantly hamper low visibility operations. It was not immediately clear how many towers the wireless companies agreed not to activate. U.S. President Joe Biden hailed the agreement, saying in a statement, quote, This agreement will avoid potentially devastating disruptions to passenger travel and cargo operations while White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki called for a lasting solution. Our objective is, of course, to reach a solution uh, around 5G deployment that maintains the highest level of safety while minimizing disruptions to passenger travel. That's what we're working towards. It was the third time that AT&T and Verizon agreed to delay deployment of the new C-band 5G wireless service. The chief executives of major U.S. passenger and cargo carriers on Monday said new 5G service could render a significant number of wide-body aircraft unusable, could potentially strand tens of thousands of Americans overseas, and cause chaos for U.S. flights. 
Now, the FAA and airlines must grapple with how to resolve the concerns permanently. Despite Tuesday's agreement, major foreign carriers including Air India and Japan's biggest airline, ANA Holdings, said they had canceled some U.S.-bound flights because of possible 5G interference. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Microsoft announced yesterday that it's set to acquire Call of Duty maker Activision Blizzard for 68.7 billion US dollars in cash, the largest deal in the sector. Microsoft's offer of $95 per share is actually 45% higher than in value when markets closed. Anders Breivik, the man convicted of killing 77 people in Norway's worst peacetime atrocity in 2011, gave a Nazi salute as he arrived in court for a parole hearing to decide if he should be released after spending more than a decade behind bars. Hong Kong warned people not to kiss pets and ordered a mass call of hamsters to the outrage of animal lovers after 11 of the rodents tested positive for COVID-19. A recent coronavirus cluster in humans traced a pet shop worker prompted checks on hundreds of animals in the Chinese rural territory with 11 hamsters found and infected. South Korea's Hyundai Motors and Kia Motors have regained fourth place in terms of their share of Europe's auto market, leapfrogging BMW. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow on more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at children sledding and building snowmen, enjoying a snow day as the weather eased in Toronto. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.